So I'd like to talk to you today about the difference between a trip and a journey. In the English dictionary, the two words are very close. A trip is defined as going somewhere and then coming back. A journey is defined as going somewhere. You see what I left out? At the end of the journey, you're in a new place. At the end of a trip, you've just come back to where you started. So this is me about to go on a trip in Afghanistan. My friend, a French gendarmerie, his name is Jean-Luc, and we were going to Gardez from Kabul, the, the capital in Afghanistan. And then we were gonna come back to Kabul. But we were also going on a journey. And we were going on a journey with the Afghan Civil Order Police. So if you know anything about the Civil Order Police, you know it can be exciting traveling with them. For one thing, if they get shot at, they just go and chase whoever shot at them until they get them. So for me, the thought that if somebody shot at us on the road to Gardez, we would be in a battle it was very exciting to me because back then I was young and stupid. But we were taking a journey to Gardez and on a journey, you learn something, you change at the end of a journey. And on this journey, I learned something about myself and Americans. I learned that you have to hide from Americans sometimes in Afghanistan. So let me explain. We got down to Gardez, nobody shot at us, so we didn't get any battles. But when we got to Gardez, the Afghan Civil Order Police Commander wanted to talk to the Army Commander at the base in Gardez. So we stopped outside of the base, a big convoy, waiting to go inside. All of a sudden, Jean-Luc starts sliding down in his chair, in the, in the car, like he was hiding. I said, Jean-Luc, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm hiding from the Americans. And I thought that was funny because I'm American. So I said, why, why are you hiding? And he said, well, the American commander in this area doesn't like it when the NATO forces travel with the Afghans because the Afghan vehicles are not armored. So if he catches us, he's gonna make us fly back in a helicopter to Kabul. He said, I think I see him up, up ahead. So I started to slide down into the chair. So we didn't get caught and we were able to continue on our journey with the Afghans. But I learned that sometimes you have to hide from Americans in Afghanistan, even when you're American. Now, if you've ever taken a class in strategy or in business administration, you might have been told that no matter what you're doing, you just need to go ahead and plan like you're going on a trip. So this is what a lot of times you might get in business administration or strategic planning. No matter what you're doing, even if you don't really know where you're going, you just draw a bunch of lines. As long as your lines are going from left to right, you'll probably get to where you want to go. It's like a trip. Now, this was the military version of what I learned in business school. It looks the same, right? This was our strategy in 2010 in Afghanistan. So we have a lot of complexity on the left, that's Afghanistan, but our arrows are going not only to the right, but they're also going up, so that's really good. Security, development, governance was our, was our strategy, and it would lead to peace, so we're taking a trip to peace. Now, this wasn't the first time that I'd received some training in a classroom that didn't seem to match with reality for me. The first time I was taught in a classroom how to do an ambush, this is what they showed us. Notice the night, nice, neat lines, the straight lines, the angles. It, it really looks geometrically elegant. Like if you get all the angles correct, then your ambush will go perfectly. So then we went out into the woods, and this is what I saw. There's no neat lines, no neat angles, there's trees in the way. I couldn't even see the road. But we went ahead and I put left side security out, right side security out, put my assault line in the middle, and we waited. And then I got a call from my left side. Hey, we have enemy, three enemy on the road. Do you see them? I said, no, I don't see them. So I tried to move to where I could see them, and I thought I saw something up on the right move, so I yelled out, fire. So we, we shot our weapons for about a minute, I yelled, cease fire, and then we assaulted up to the road, and there was no enemy on the road. So it, it went terrible. We had missed them. They'd already gone by. So we practiced and practiced and practiced, and eventually we decided that it was best 
to learn how to do an ambush by adapting to where the ambush was going to be and learning how to do the ambush at the site of the ambush, because every ambush site was very different. Yes, we had to plan our trip to the ambush site, but after that, it was really about adapting and learning. So if you're going to approach things differently if you're taking a journey, how might you do that? Well, I think there's an infinite amount of ways to do it. But I'd like to give you three examples. And this is the first example. I want you to ima imagine you're in that plane. You're on that plane and you're part of a special forces team, a US special forces team. So 12 guys are on your team and you're taking off from America and it's 1994 and you're going to Haiti. So in 1994, Haiti had a military government. They had kicked out the president, President Aristide, and the Americans had decided to go back in and restore democracy. So your team's mission is to parachute in and seize a radio tower, a communications node. Right before you're about to jump out of the plane, your boss comes up to you and says, wait, we have former President Jimmy Carter and General Colin Powell have met with the government and they have decided to let President Aristide back in. They're gonna give up power. So your mission's changed. You're not jumping in, we're gonna land, and you're gonna to go to the small town of Jock Mel. And when you're there, you're going to establish peace. That's your new mission. So how do you do that? Do you, do you plan a trip to peace, like you saw in the strategy for Afghanistan? Um, definitely you'll have to plan out a trip to Jock Mel. We landed and went to Jock Mel, but what do you do then? Well, let me tell you what this team did. They first met with people and they just talked to them. They talked to the mayor, they talked to several members of the town, they talked to the police force. They asked questions. They prioritized learning. One of the things they found out about was that the secret police had an element in this town and they were very, very bad. They had been killing a lot of people for about a year or more. And so the townspeople said if you could please get rid of the secret police, our lives would be much better. So they, they actually arrested the secret police. They, they got a plan together, planned out a trip. They uh, arrested the secret police and sent them to the prison. But the leader of the secret police, he was known as Achade. Now in Creole, that's the language in Haiti, that's slang for criminal times 10. So this guy was like really bad. And he had come back and he had climbed up on his balcony in his house and he was drinking and yelling about killing people again. So the townspeople went to the special forces team and said, hey, can you do something about Acha Day? He is the, the, the worst of the bad. Well, the special forces team was busy and they only had one guy available. And that guy's name was Sergeant First Class Sam McEnany. And the locals couldn't pronounce that name right. They called him Macaroni. But they said, Macaroni, can you help us? Acha Day, the big, big bad guy is, is here. Sam didn't wait at all. He jumped in his vehicle roared up to the house, kicked open the door, and in a matter of seconds, had Achadea on the ground and handcuffed. So then Sam was a hero. They told stories about him. They actually made up songs about Sam. But the team didn't stop there. They found out that the town had not had electricity for a whole year. So they worked to get the power generator back up and provide electricity. They also adopted a little boy named Pierre. Pierre had some health problems, and every special forces team has a medic, at least one. So they helped him with his health problems, they gave him food, they paid for his school supplies so he could go back to school. And Pierre actually wrote a song about Sam Macaroni, Macaroni the Hero. But the team did all of these things not to get to peace, they, they, they were learning. They just wanted to learn what the town needed, what the people needed. And that got them to peace faster than if they had tried to plan out a trip to peace. Now, sometimes learning isn't enough. Sometimes you might be managing a lot of different efforts to learn. So one of the things that I've learned from complex adaptive systems theory is that in a complex and rapidly changing environment, managing lots of different attempts to learn, it's best to maybe try different experiments see which ones work, resource those that work, and the ones that don't, don't work, seem to work, try something different, experiment some other way. And one of the examples that I, I saw in Afghanistan of this 
was with the Afghan local police initiative. So a lot of Afghan towns didn't have any police. And so the towns that were either far away from the police or didn't have a, a police uh, station, the International Security Assistance Force would send special forces team out to the towns and say, would you like to have your own local police unit? Well, if the elders of the town wanted the police unit and they were willing to support the police and provide police for the unit, then the special forces teams would assist them. If it worked, if the town became more secure, then the special forces teams would assist them more. If it didn't, then they would try something else. Now, this is very different than what I saw with the Afghan National Police. So the na National Police would all get the same training. No matter where they were gonna be assigned or what they were gonna be doing, they all got standardized training. In the local police, they had unique experiences. I went to one of the training centers for the National Police in Helmand in the South. And we went up to one of the policemen, this guy, Kabir, he was from Fra in the Western province in Afghanistan, and we asked him, you've been a policeman for a year, now you're getting training. We, we were talking to him through an interpreter, and we said, what would you do differently now that you've got the training if you, maybe you were gonna arrest somebody? And Kabir said, actually, I wouldn't do anything differently because before we didn't have a court system, we didn't have any judges, and we didn't have a prison system, we didn't have a prison. So what we would do is we would just throw criminals in the police station if they couldn't pay or their family couldn't pay, and they would just sit there for a long time. And now when I go back, we still don't have a court system or a prison system, so we'll just do the same thing. Now this was different in the local police. So in, in Wardak province, for instance, uh, Captain Anderson that I knew had talked to the elders, and he said, what would you like us to do um, with prisoners that the, the local police capture? And the elder, the, uh, the top elder, Halim, said, well, in the past, we decided what would happen to any problem, problems in our town. And so we would like that back. And so Captain Anderson had his team train up the local police unit on how to bring a criminal to the elders, bring all the families involved, and then present the case to the elders, and the elders decided what to do uh, with the accused. And that made the town happy, made the elders happy, made the local police happy. So it was really, an example of doing something unique for this situation instead of everybody getting the same kind of experience. Now, sometimes learning and doing lots of experiments is not enough. Sometimes you have to design yourself or your, your whole team to fit in the situation that you're in. So one of the examples that, that I have seen in my career on that is when I went to Honduras about 19 years ago, the first time I went. And I was there with my team sergeant, and that's him on the right, Manny. Manny was American, but he had been born in Chile. So he spoke Spanish much better than I did. And we went into the headquarters of the, of the Honduran military. There were lots of generals, lots of officers in there. And Manny was just a sergeant. But the top commander of the whole military yelled out, Manny! And he ran up to Manny and gave him a big hug because he had worked with Manny back when he was a lieutenant, a young lieutenant just starting out. And Manny had been a really, really young sergeant. And they trusted each other, and because of that, we were friends, everybody was friends. We went out to dinner, had a big feast with the general at his house, smoked cigars. But I don't know if you understand how interesting that is, because most sergeants just can't walk into the top headquarters of, of a foreign country, their military, and just walk up to the top general much less actually know him. And because the special forces will design their teams around the mission that they're going on and allow you to do what you do best, regardless of your rank and regardless of what you've been trained on, that ability to be unique and design your team to the mission is very powerful. So this is me towards the end of my Afghanistan journey in 2010. I, I took a journey, I lear learned a lot of new things. I learned how to play cricket with the Afghans and the British and the Australians. That was one of the things I learned. And I changed when I came back from Afghanistan. A lot of people noticed that I had changed. Some good, some bad, but I, had, I was a different person. I had gone on a journey. If you go on a trip 
and you haven't changed, then you haven't gone on a journey. To, to go on a journey, you really have to change. And to prepare to learn and change on your journey, there's, there's really an infinite amount of, of ways you can do it. I give you three examples. Prioritize learning, do lots of different experiments, and then the final one, design yourself or design your team around the situation that you're in. Thank you.